Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the forum of the group exhibit Hydrogen Fuel Cells and Batteries here on Anova Fair 2015. Please be invited to sit down, have a drink on the house, and discuss with us because uh, the next topic will be very interesting. It's uh, all about uh, how to store hydrogen, you know, in, uh, in a nice and intelligent way. And I will uh, talk with the CEO and Chief Scientific Officer of Seller Energy Limited, Professor Stephen Bennington, about from unmanned aerial vehicles to automotive, taking a hydrogen storage material to market. So, uh, happy, looking forward to have you here on stage, Stephen. Nice to have you here. And everybody's invited to uh, ask questions. If you want uh, to, uh, to ask a question, just raise your hand. I'll be with the microphone right uh, with you. So, um, Seller Energy Limited is a spin-off of a UK government science and technology facility council based near Oxford, UK, uh, and uh, was founded in 2011. You were a professor there, weren't you? Uh, I work there, but I'm a professor at University College London, so the, the London Centre for Nanotechnology. Okay, so uh, um, this is your company uh, now, you're the CEO, you probably don't do many lectures anymore. No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so it's a, it's a yeah, big, big work to do probably. I think we should talk a little bit about hydrogen. Hydrogen is a, is a perfect fuel. It's absolutely clean. When you use it in a fuel cell, it only produces water. So uh, there's nothing bad about hydrogen, is it? No, it's a, it's a really compact fuel, or a com not compact fuel, but a very de energy dense fuel. Yeah. So it means that you have a lot of energy per kilogram. And as you say, the, it's, a, it's really clean. Yeah. So in terms of hitting any, uh, any legislative targets or any uh, clean energy targets, it's, it's, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. But the problem is you can't dig it. You know, it's, it's not like oil that you find somewhere in the ground and you, you have to produce it and you have to store it. And this is the, the problem with hydrogen. Exactly. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a manufactured fuel. It's something you have to, to make and then you have to store it. You have to find some way of uh, conveniently storing that hydrogen and solving all that logistics chain that you have. All that problem of getting it from the place where you make it to the place where it's used in a safe and convenient and compact form. And you found a solution for that problem? Yeah, so we're working on uh, chemical hydrides. So we've made a, a, a nanocomposite material made of um, uh, hydrogen storage material plus um, polymers. And it means that you have something which is, you can form, you can make it into any shape you like. So you can extrude it, or you can press it, or you can, uh, well, you can, you can use plastic forming techniques to make it into any shape you, you is useful for your particular application. Um, and then when you heat it up to 120 degrees C, 100, 120 degrees C, the hydrogen comes out nice and quickly. So it's compact and it's safe. Uh, there's no high pressures, there's no cryogenic temperatures. It's really a convenient way of handling and storing your hydrogen and transporting it. So I have to understand that. So, so you have the little nano composites that look like, like little sweets uh, you, you could even eat. Uh, and, and it's full of hydrogen, is it? Yeah, I mean, it, it does look very dull. So the whole point is to stop hydrogen being exciting. So hydrogen is a bit too exciting for many people. And so we made it into a very boring white plastic. Uh, and that plastic contains um, one liter of hydrogen for every gram of material. And so it's, it, it, you know, it's nice and compact. It doesn't take much energy to get it out. Um, so you know, it's, it's a, a, a good practical way of storing hydrogen. So where you normally need one liter of, of place or compress a little bit less, uh, you only need one gram of your material. So there is all the hydrogen in. And it comes out when you heat it up to 100 degrees? Yes, yeah, so, um, so it starts to come out a little bit lower than that, but uh, 100 degrees C it's coming out quite quickly. 120 degrees C it's coming out very quickly. I've heard about solutions how to store hydrogen like in methanol, but methanol had the disadvantage it's, it's uh, poisonous. What about your nanocomposites? Are they poisonous as well? Well, it's, it's not poisonous. It's, uh, I wouldn't say you want to eat it, it's, so it's, uh, the toxicity is low. Um, um, so it's, you can handle it. It's something that you can put in your hand, you can uh, manipulate and touch, and it's, it's not particularly poisonous. I guess in terms of the toxicity level, it's a bit like gasoline. It's that kind of level. Wash your hands after you touch it. It's that kind of toxicity. So I can imagine, well, this is a big advantage if you don't need the pressure to store the hydrogen. You have it in these nanomaterials. Mm -hmm. But once they're out, what do you do with the nanomaterials then? 
Uh, you mean afterwards or? Afterwards, uh, yeah. Mm. Well, it, OK, so the, the difference between ours and, uh, and other storage methods is the regeneration. So normally, if you're using compressed hydrogen, of course, you can just refill the tank. That's really quite straightforward. If you're using a metal hydrogen, which some of you uh, might be uh, familiar with, then you can just recharge that straight away. Ours is more complex. Um, it contains a lot more uh, hydrogen than a metal hydride would, but you have to use a chemical process to regenerate it. So you have to dissolve it in a solvent, take it through a chemical process, and reform the materials again. So you, if you're going for the large scale applications, then you do need to go through that regeneration cycle. So if I imagine a fuel cell car running uh, with your nano composites, uh, you just take the old ones out and fill the, the fresh ones in? Yeah, so for the large scale applications, what we're working on at the moment, mostly in, with aerospace, not uh, automotive, um, is small beads small pellets of the material that you can, you can move by blowing them. So we use really a domestic hoover, a domestic uh, vacuum cleaner, and that can pump pellets into a device, and it can pump pellets back out of the device. And so the refueling is uh, relatively simple. It is very simple, in fact, and very cheap, because the, the components are, don't cost anything, really. Uh, and the, the overall um, uh, system is compact and lightweight. When I heard the first time about your technology, I thought, oh, this is very clever, mm. but it probably will never happen because they're already building up a hydrogen infrastructure. So you have to find business cases that work already exactly. now, yep. and you found them. Yes. Let's, let's talk about the unmanned aerial um, devices. Vehicles, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was right. So, I mean, obviously, the automotive is a nice, big, sexy market, and everyone talks about the transport markets but they are the most cost sensitive. They're the ones where you have to drive that cost right down. You need to be making thousands and thousands of tons of it, maybe tens of thousands of tons of it. It's really tough to get into that market. The barriers to get in are huge. So what we're working on is other sectors, looking for those niches where people absolutely need power uh, and are willing to pay a little bit more for it, for the, uh, a new technology. And uh, one of the few first technologies we're intending to go into is unmanned aerial vehicles. So we can make a device with a cartridge of our material plus a fuel cell, which is one third of the uh, weight for the same energy of a lithium ion battery. So for things like unmanned aerial vehicles, that's three times the range. So you're selling it on performance. So it's not driven by legislation or driven by you know, vagar vagaries of government policy. It's driven entirely by the fact that you can beat the incumbent technology in terms of performance. And people are willing to pay for that. So Uh, in terms of where we are in that technology, we've done a, a couple of different prototypes. We're now building our uh, third prototype, which will be um, with us in April, and aiming to get that one flying uh, in July. And just uh, hopefully signing up with a, uh, a manufacturer to commercialize that uh, later this year, probably in May. So what are these vehicles? Are they quadcopters or, or flying drones, or what are they? Yeah, we, um, so we're not talking about the big predators, you know, the big uh, military ones. We're talking um, small-scale ones, so anything from uh, of the order of three kilograms up to 20 as the region where we're working. And that's because they're big enough. We can't scale our technology down to the really tiny ones. Um, but they're all electrically powered. And so they use batteries, and their performance is limited by the poor performance of the poor specific energy of lithium-ion batteries. And we can do a lot better than that. So they're used in a, a mostly military at the moment, and that will be a, an early market. Um, but it's growing enormously. By 2023, it's talked about as being a, an $80 billion dollar market in the US alone and mostly for agriculture, precision agriculture. So these aerial vehicles normally uh, drive with batteries, um, yep. but batteries are very heavy, yep. and your solution is much less heavy. Much so you, if you take the same uh, weight on mm -hmm. this uh, vehicle, um, mm -hmm. how much more energy can you get out of it? It is three times. Three times. Already. So, okay. uh, and in aerospace applications, three times means three times the range. Yeah. So in terms of performance, that's huge. So, so we're so working just, on... It's sorry. just this power supply, actually. You know, That's we're right. not talking about any, any technology. They're only interested in this surplus power supply. Yeah. So in the, in the first um, um, people we're working with, obviously what we're doing is trying to design a system which is drop-in. So in other words, it's a system that uh, where they take out their battery and we have a system uh, and it's exactly the same size and volume. 
Um, for the next generation, obviously we'd like to have a drone that's entirely designed around the fuel cell, so the air intakes are used for cooling, et cetera, et cetera. So there's another stage we can go to to improve the technology. But even, even as we are now, we can, we can have significant improvements over the, uh, the existing technology. And this also means you can be three times as expensive as a battery, but you're probably, more. <laughs> <laughs> you're probably more. Yeah. Well, it depends on how you, um, you cost it. Obviously, per flight, uh, if you can recharge your batteries, that's what you would do. But there are certain missions that you simply cannot fly with the range that you have now, and people are willing to pay, it, pay for it. So if you're talking about a first responder or an emergency situation where they need to put something up in the air for a long period of time, then you know, paying a few hundred dollars for a cartridge is nothing. So, uh, you know, and, and for the military, uh, it's also not really an issue in terms of the cost. It's low enough. So there are, even with the cost of our technology now, we know that we can sell into that market. I believe there will be a huge market for these quadrocopters and, and all these devices that can fly. Mm. Uh, as you mentioned already, agricultural is, is a big big item. Be, if you have sure. big fields, you can't just go on, on, on the land and, and see how your crops are growing. Mm -hmm. You better uh, see that from, from above and, and many uh, people in agriculture use that already. They do. I mean, it's, um, the licensing is quite tight in Europe and America, but it's, it's less tight in, say, Japan or in South America, where they're already used heavily. Um, so the, but the legislation is changing. Over the next two years, you'll see the uh, aviation authorities, both on, in Europe and in America, uh, changing dramatically. They've already got to outline plans, and as soon as they do that, it will be, uh, it'll, it'll trigger a massive explosion in this market. And you can also use that for, for emergency reasons or rescue reasons yep. to, to uh, yep. survey a, a certain area, which is big. Yeah. That's right. So, uh, like I said, first responder, if you want to get somebody out to actually see at an emergency site uh, what you need, then, uh, then drones are perfect. If you um, want to do fisheries or uh, you're doing Coast Guard, um, any kind of uh, emergency search and rescue, all these kinds of things are, uh, are going to be opened up in terms of the legislation very, go very soon. The ones that are going to be longer term, you may have seen in the, uh, in the literature, are deliveries. I know DHL and uh, Amazon and Google are that all talking about the, using... That might be the biggest that's business That's huge, case. That's, that's but the, uh, it's going to be a while before the aviation authorities will allow those things to, uh, to fly in cities. Um, but when that happens, that will be enormous. Probably they change the law because it becomes so so strong and, yes. and everybody wants it. Yes. So they probably change the law. That's. that's I mean, they're already doing it. So uh, in Bonn, in uh, the DHL have a, a drone they did which that they. Once, yes, yeah, they've it. been flying pharmaceuticals and things um, through through the city. So that it has been done as a test, but the uh, aviation authorities need to change the legislation for it to really take off. It's going to be very interesting mm. indeed. And there's also a private market, as, as I believe. So many people love to fly. The these quadrocopters oh, yeah. for yeah, yeah. just for private use so for, right. as a hobby. Yeah. If we can get the price down, then then obviously that market also becomes important. Um, but at the moment, it's going to be for for big businesses and uh, and emergency services and things like that. So that's your first business case. But mm -hmm. you found a second one. You uh, think well, we could use uh, battery cars with a mm -hmm. range extender. How should that work? Yeah. So we have uh, we have projects in uh, in the automotive space, but we're not going to try and power an entire vehicle. We realize that there, are, there is range anxiety in electric vehicles, and so there is the, uh, the possibility of putting in a range extender to give you an extra 200 kilometers. So this is not something that you would use every day. You know, every day you might just use the batteries to get you to and from work to commute. But you know, at the weekend when you want to go and visit grandma and she's 200 kilometers away, you do need something to take you that little a bit further. And so having something in the back of your vehicle which overcomes your anxiety means that you can always get back to base, you can always go that little bit further, is I think a, a compelling argument. And we're developing a device now, a five kilowatt device, which we'll be putting into vehicles later this year. There are already cars with range extender out there. Um, well, they, they work on, on internal combustion engines, yep. uh, but yours works on a fuel cell then. That's right. So um, obviously the internal combustion engines beat us in terms of performance and cost that we can't beat that. But if you do need uh, something which is clean, uh, so if you are working in the center of a city and there are legislative targets, then obviously we can, we can do that. So, but how do you get the fuel then again? You, you need mm. some kind of cartridge or yeah. something. Yeah. So in this case, um, the fuel cell we fixed permanently in the back of the vehicle. And we're making these cylindrical cartridges. They're about 30 centimeters in diameter. And these plug into the back of your vehicle. Now, the one difference that we have compared to batteries is that um, batteries, of course, if you breach the containment, there's a very good chance they'll catch fire. Um, all the materials are pyrophoric. If they're exposed to atmosphere, they burn. 
automatically. Whereas our material doesn't. You can hold it in air and it's perfectly safe. So in other words, the UN transport codes for our, our systems are much lower than those for, for lithium-ion batteries. That's a huge benefit for the UAV market, but it's also a massive benefit for this market because it means that you can just load them into the back of a van, transport them out to, uh, to any filling station or, or retail outlet, and people can buy it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot... It's a, it, we, we think that that particular selling point is going to be quite important for us. Is there already an OEM who's producing these kind of cars? Or? Um, we have interest from OEMs, and when our government-funded project finishes later this year, we're um, negotiating with a, a, a couple. We hope one of them will pick up uh, to take this project on into field trials. We are looking forward to hear something. I would like to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody out there, <laughs> then uh, we're interested. And there's a third business case, which is uh, in the aerospace application. You had made mm -hmm. contracts with uh, Safran, which is yep. a tier one uh, supplier for, for the big uh, yeah, flight companies. That's right. Um, what do you do there? Well, that's... I mean, in aircraft, you're not powering the aircraft, but there are a whole bunch of uh, energy systems on the aircraft that they're interested in. So everything from uh, emergency power systems, things called ram air turbines, or all the way through to powering the galley and the auxiliary power units which are used to power the aircraft on the ground. All those different units uh, are heavy uh, and uh, often complex, and they require a lot of power and cabling within the aircraft. So we're looking at uh, um, replacing those with fuel cell systems. Now, the legislation drivers in aerospace aren't so strong at the moment, but they are threatening, uh, and the aerospace companies are worried, and all of them have fuel cell programs. Every single one of them has a, a detailed fuel cell program, but the problem is they don't like compressed gas because they, the aerospace compliance legislation is so tough, they'd never believe that they're going to get compressed gas into an aircraft. And they're never going to get a compressor airside on, a, on an airport. They need some other storage mechanic method. And so we've had a lot of interest from aerospace. So and your us. nanocomposites are just the, the right uh, solution for that, for that problem. That's right, no pressure. if I got that right, it's like a distributed power solution for, for aircraft. So you can have yep. an, a power source in the, in the rear and one in the front. That's right. It turns out, although the uh, auxiliary power units and, uh, and central power units on an aircraft are very efficient, um, they're heavy because they have to have copper. And uh, so a lot of the wiring within, a lot of the weight of the systems is actually the wiring, the, the looms that go throughout the aircraft. If you can have a small distributed system that's powering your galley, for example, that gives you combined heat and power, then uh, you can save considerable weight on the aircraft. So again, it's a performance sale, but it also shaves a few percent off your CO2 emissions, uh, and they, that is the kind of percentage that they're looking to save in aircraft. So it's worthwhile. Very good. Are there any questions from your side? Uh be right with you. If not, uh, I would like to thank you very much. We are running out of time, actually. Uh, it was very interesting to talk to you again. And thank you very much. a lot of things has happened since last year already. So I'm looking forward to the next talk we will have in one year's time. <laughs> and uh, whoever wants more information, just uh, visit uh, Professor Stephen to his booth of Seller Energy at D56, just down the left row over there. And please stay tuned for the next interview here with Professor Dr. Gunter Kolb, who is already here, head of Energy Department of Frau Bonhoeffer, ECT, IMM, about uh, hydrogen production from renewable resources, alcohols and polyalcohols. Once again, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bennington, for this interesting talk and uh, good luck for you.